Hey everyone and welcome back to the podcast. So before I get into introducing our guest today, I wanted to let you all know something exciting. The Chronically Healing podcast was featured in a blog on Feedspot called The Top 20 Chronic Illness Podcast You Must Follow in 2019. I'll have it linked in the show notes down below and the blog post with the episode, but I appreciate the podcast being added to the list and I hope you guys will go over there and read it. But moving on to today's episode, we have Michael Collins on the show. So Mike is the founder of SugarAddiction.com. He's the board chairman of Food Addiction Institute and has been completely sugar-free, completely, for over 30 years. And he has worked closely with others to help them regain their lives ravaged by this addictive product. So Mike has been in the recover or has been in recovery from the substance use disorder for over 34 years. We have a great conversation today about all of the real and emotional sides of sugar addiction and how it might be affecting your health. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And let's go. Hey, hey, friends. This is Jesse DeShane, a chronic illness support coach and host over here on the Chronically Healing Podcast. When I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I was scared and immediately started looking for support. After finding so much negativity in the autoimmune world, I decided to start a community that emphasizes positivity and healing. On this show, you will hear me have conversations with people just like you who are on their own unique healing journey with chronic illness. There might be a few tears, but you are guaranteed to have a bunch of laughs and lots and lots of love and support. Let's dive into the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast, and welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you for being on today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm excited to dive in, so why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about you, who you are, and all things like that. Sure. I've got a short version. I can answer any questions, kind of a podcast version, cut it, it doesn't go on too long, but uh, I grew up like any other kid. I mean, I liked sugar stuff and my mom was a sugar junkie, my favorite sugar junkie. She had a stash around the house. And (laughs) so she, you know, we, we had everything. I mean, we could access sugar all day, any day. And and there was no real uh, governor on any of that. In other words, Mm. we didn't, she didn't think of it as a detriment, really. We, we had bread and butter and sugar sandwiches. And yeah. we, we didn't have Kool-Aid. I mean, we didn't have soda, but we had Kool-Aid and we would make it with uh, three times the sugar requirement of the, spec, <laughs> of the package. And she had all kind of candy around, right? So it was pretty normal. And uh, I actually think my mother died of sugar addiction. I mean, all mm. of the maladies that uh, you can think of she had that today we know could possibly could have been caused by sugar addiction or sugar in general, metabolic syndrome type stuff. And, uh, you know, as I grew, I, 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 there's a great YouTube video, Eric Clapton's talking to Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes, right? He says to him, so Eric, this thing, they're sitting in a $7 million Antigua treatment center for drugs and alcohol that Eric built to help people. And Ed says to Eric, he says, this all started with heroin, right? Uh, Eric, he says, no, Ed, it started with sugar. Mm. And then he said, sugar is all puzzled, right? He says, yeah, I, w- anything that would change my state. I used to eat bread and butter and sugar sandwiches at six years old, so I would feel better when I was alone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had the same thing. And then it just kind of evolved. About 13 or 14, I ran into beer and alcohol and drugs. And that party lasted until I was about 28, right? But I did, as I got sober... The same thing most recovering folks do is they substitute sugar for the drugs. This is actually in some of the recovery literature that this is a good idea. (laughs) And a strange group of my clients now, since I went public with this, are Mm -hmm. recovering folks who can't quit sugar. So, I mean, they quit hard drugs, right? And so there I am, uh, kind of sober and few years in, I started studying sugar. And I read a book called Sugar Blues, right? Sugar Mm -hmm. Blues was pretty famous in its day in the late 70s and a remake in the 80s. And uh, there was the guy, the author was at a party and he was putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee, right? And the lady, a voice from behind says, I wouldn't have that in my house, let alone my body. And it was Gloria Swanson, like the famous movie star. Mm -hmm. And uh, they end up marrying and she helped him promote that book. And I read that book. I just loved it. The history was great about 
picking up slaves and from England and, and on empty ships, going to the Caribbean, picking up the sugar rum and molasses, maybe stopping in the States and then going back to England and building an empire, right? Very interesting how we got ourselves here. And so I just, you know, eventually um, got off sugar by myself. I, you know, I had a few mentors and that kind of thing, but, um, and I got married and, and we, I somehow talked my wife at the time into not having any sugar and flour and caffeine during the pregnancy. And we kept the kids sugar free till they were six years old. And that's somehow becoming the fastest growing thing that we're doing is, you know, helping parents interested in that mm. to get to either start without sugar or to get off sugar once they're on it. And about 10 years ago, I bought the domain sugaraddiction.com. I didn't really do it. I had a regular life. You know, I've been sugar free now 30 some odd years and I had, you know, was in business and, and I never wanted to be, I never wanted to be the anti candy man. That was not one of my goals in life. But I just couldn't watch the kids. You know, as I, when I was younger, there wasn't any overweight kids. There was no, I mean, we had a high school of 3,000, maybe one or two obese, maybe two or four or 10 overweight. But now it's a third obese, a third overweight in children, right? Wow. And so I couldn't watch it anymore. And I started to educate folks. And it's only been the last couple of years that I started full time coaching and building groups on online and stuff to help folks get off the sugar. And it's really just kind of uh, a real big demand now because people are, you know, 100, 200, 300 pounds overweight, mm. losing limbs, going blind, getting diabetes diagnosis, their doctors tell them they're going to die, and they still can't quit. So I know it's real. I've just helped so many people get off it, uh, get off sugar, and especially, like I said, the recovering alcoholics and addicts who they beat something what other people think are, is some, you know, harder quote unquote substance, but they've been sober five, 10, 15 years, they can't quit sugar and they needed help. So it's very real. And I think that's a question a lot of people want to know the answer to, is it real or is it, you know, the big sugar, big food companies kind of obfuscating the truth about whether or not it's a real addiction. So mm -hmm. that's the short version. I can, I can fill in any of the blanks if you want. <laughs> What so what does I don't know if this is too broad of a question, but what does sugar addiction look like for people? So I'm just thinking like I feel like some people almost use like, oh, I'm addicted to sugar as like yeah. just kind of being funny. They're not actually thinking about it as like, oh, this is an actual addiction. So what can this look like for people? That's very common, and you're a hundred percent right. And the people are the the jokes about I'm addicted to bread, I'm addicted to candy, I'm addicted to soda, whatever. Mm. It's a joking thing. And there's, I, you probably remember him, Rodney Dangerfield. He was a comedian. He used to yank on his red tie and say, I get no respect. I get no respect. Right. And he didn't, after a while, didn't even have to say the joke. He just said, I get no respect. Mm. And people would laugh. Well, sugar gets no respect as a drug, a psychoactive drug of addiction. And the reason I'm so, uh, adamant about this now is working with hundreds of people in person, thousands online, I see all the complaints and, and the, the attempts to quit and the, the failures. And it models people trying to quit alcohol or drugs. And the most important thing is that the thing that the science is now proving out, and that's the important part, is that Sugar affects the same, and you know, you hear the things like it's the same as you know, more addictive than cocaine and all that stuff. Well, yeah, maybe, but you know, we can't, we're not going to send society on that big a journey. You have to think more like nicotine, which people know is a hard drug to get off of. And it's the same thing. It affects the dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, uh, even the adrenals and the big one, oxytocin, it affects your brain reward system. Right. Same thing as drugs, same thing as alcohol, same thing as nicotine. And it's the dose, Dr. Lustig, the famous sugar educator, says it's dose dependent. Mm -hmm. Now we're pounding 150 pounds a year through our bodies, average, some people a lot more. Wow. And when you're getting that much uh, manipulation of your brain chemicals, and more importantly, when you try and stop, when we get to be our age, when you get to be an adult, you are no longer you know, getting that little buzz that the four-year-olds get at the birthday party. So you are actually fighting withdrawals because you don't have time. Mm -hmm. And having helped hundreds and even thousands in a group setting online 
of people go through withdrawals, the withdrawals are I, not identical for every person, but they are, they are real. There's lethargy, there's depression, there's headaches, there's um, uh, just a whole host of stuff mm -hmm. that people go through. And the way or the reason that they stop is because they can't, afford their life to be down, shut down for 10 days. So they ingest a little bit of sugar to get them through the meeting or through the parenting or to get them through the whatever, and then they're back to the races. So is it real sugar addiction? Yes. Is it, um, what does it look like? It looks like any other addiction if you pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people don't, or I think what happens is that people because it's ubiquitous and damn near free, people think of it as this is my life, okay? Mm -hmm. That, and then aging is the same way, right? They think that we need to, that we age this way. These are things, maladies that we get, diabetes and these kinds of things. When it's just not true. There's so few sugar-free people that it's hard to even separate them, right? But they think that they're tired or they're irritable or this or that. But when you go sugar-free and you actually write it down and you don't pay attention to it all, all that stuff goes away. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had mentioned about Hashimoto's. I mean, I've had people, they no longer have that illness, mm -hmm. or that, that uh, lupus. Um, all kinds of things go away when you eliminate this product from your life, right? And seeing it, you know, genius is only pattern recognition. And I'm not far from a genius, but the idea that I've seen so many people uh, repeat the process after they're successful to get off all kind of meds, both psychotropic and physical, diabetic. People that have gone from not being diet, from being diabetic, um, diagnosed with diabetes two. Now the doctor says they no longer have diabetes two, and I've seen this so many times that it now is common. It's perfect. I mean, it's normal practice for me. I see it all the time. And I think that this information isn't getting out there from people who are doing it over and over and over and seeing the patterns over and over and over. So that's what it looks like, I think. It, it looks a little obfuscated to the general public because it's enculturated so much, right? It's so ingrained in our parties and our life and 80% of the food products that we just don't know what it's like to live without sugar until you try it. And then it's hard to get off like in any other addiction. Yeah, and it can have such an emotional effect too. Like oh. with with just um I'm just thinking about myself. I mean, not so much anymore because with all the diets I've had to do for my autoimmune disease, a lot of them do cut sugar out or back quite a bit. Yeah. Um but like, you know, just a, a stereotypical like woman going through a breakup eats a pint of ice cream. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's even like a stereotypical emotional responses to reach for sugar. Do you see that? Well, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Not only did you hit the, why I think people continue to ingest, but I think how they understand to get out of it, get off of it, right? One of the things people refuse to accept or, and in recovery circles, denial is a symptom of the disease. You didn't deny that you wrecking cars and, and getting arrested for public intoxication that you don't have an alcohol problem, right? Mm -hmm. You're able to, you're able to actually look at your life and say, no, I don't have it. <laughs> That's just like, and, and it's like irrational. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's, and it's actually a symptom of the disease called denial. But in this scenario, people do not equate, as I mentioned before, they think this is just their life. They think that they're emotional this time, this, that, and you described it perfectly. There's a great book out there called the body remembers and the body remembers talks about, if you don't process out uh, emotional feelings mm -hmm. when they happen at the proper in the proper way and you use a substance to stop those emotions from happening then you will eventually have to pay the piper and it will come out sooner or later either sideways forward backwards it will come out in another OCDC it'll come out right mm -hmm. and people when they finally make the connection that I had a guy lost a hundred pounds on keto, right? Could not put down the sugar. I mean, he was off sugar at different times, but it kept drawing him back. And it was a time when both his parents were passing away. He was breaking up with a, a woman. And here we are 
when he finally writes it all down, he realized that the M&Ms only came into his life when there was an issue with the woman, when there was something to do with the estate or something, when there was an emotional feeling going on. And when he put those two things together, then it, the, 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 you know, the, the tumblers and the lock clicked. And so many people have had the exact same thing happen to them. When they, when they figure out that they actually use sugar to manage their emotions since they were a toddler and their parents did it to them when they were screaming and stuff a cookie in their mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And so here we are in a situation, now we're adults, we're doing it for ourselves. And no one's thinking, well, I'm going to get a line of cocaine where you got to go to the dealer and do all this, or I'm going to go to the bar and have a drink. Because you can just open the cover or you just pull into the 7-Eleven and it's like, I have a craving, I have a thought. But they don't take it that extra step and say, why am I having this craving? Why am I having this thought? 98% of the time, it's around some emotion that you're not wanting to process or you haven't processed or it's coming back up, right? And this is a little uh, soft science and a little woo-woo, but there's so many, like the Body Remembers book and so many therapists and people have gone through this with people that it's very, very real. And you're right 100%. It's all about the emotions all about the emotions yeah which i think can make like even the idea of coming off of it scary to a lot of people like sure. not even emotional but even like you mentioned before like the withdrawal symptoms too mm -hmm. like i remember the first diet um, i ever had to do for my hashimoto's was very very strict and what of course cut out dairy cut out um sugar cut out alcohol cut out caffeine um and uh gluten i was already gluten free though but it was crazy. I was anticipating this huge crash from caffeine. So I had weaned myself down slowly for weeks from caffeine. And then I went on this diet and <laughs> it was almost worse than a caffeine withdrawal from sugar. Like I yeah. just felt so awful. So, um, I mean, a few days later I felt great, but that initial yeah. feeling was so, so bad. Is there anything like if people want to get off sugar, is there anything you can do to kind of alleviate or help with some of those withdrawal symptoms? Yeah, I mean, there's been some studies that I'm um, working on some of this myself. Um, famous woman, Julia Ross, been mm -hmm. working in treatment centers for 30 years. Uh, she uses uh, like L-glutamine, mm -hmm. uh, HCP5, these kind of amino acids that are helpful in brain uh, uh, repair, like re reward center repair stuff. And it will mitigate these feelings a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I would think uh, for me, at least with the people I work with, the goal is always 100% abstinence and to get these things from whole foods. But people do want and do need a, uh, I don't want to say an easy button, but you know, we're so akin or accustomed to having a pill or taking yeah. a vitamin or a supplement. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of all that stuff, but I have seen people where it does work and it does kind of mitigate it a little bit. But it's almost, there's a great book out about drugs and alcohol, but it's what goes up must come down. I mean, you have manipulated your feel good chemicals in your brain, the ones that were supposed to be chasing food and sex and a beautiful sunset and a hug and these kinds of things, exercise, these things that evolve for a reason. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be manipulated by a drug. And when they are, they get depleted. In the, in the scientific literature, it's called the, the receptors downregulate. In other words, your dopamine, you have less of them. Okay, so you have less dopamine receptors, less serotonin. And, you know, the Paxil and the, the different... Uh, psychotropics that people use for depressions are SSRIs, serotonin, something, reuptake inhibitors or something. You know, these are, again, like a chemical experiment trying to balance or dial in your brain chemicals, which I find crazy. I mean, I think if you can just get back to whole foods, yes, they're, they're, where we shine, Jess, is, is a lot of people can muscle the 30 days or muscle the 10 day detox or the 21 day detox. But where we shine is days 30 to 365 mm -hmm. where people, the mental game comes in. I mean, it's famous in the literature. 
where 90 plus percent of people who lose any substantial amount of weight gain it all back in the first year and then some, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like in every study, I mean, it's, it's, it's like famous lore in, in, in research. Mm -hmm. And that's really because of what we've been talking about, because they feel great, they got a, you know, like a little pink cloud going, they lost a few pounds, they figure I can have just one or mm -hmm. something, uh, like a sip, a slice or whatever. And that, so many stories of people disappearing for six months or a year, coming back saying, it all started at my girlfriend's birthday party and I just had a little, you know, and they never, they don't, they're ashamed. They don't come back. They're like gone because one, and it leads us to this. And I don't, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this because I, I've just seen it so much as this societal belief in moderation, right? That, mm. that, you know, can, a, can an alcoholic just have a few beers? You know, can a drug addict have a few lines? I, I personally don't believe this. And I've, people are unwilling to accept this, that a one third probably at least of people have a sensitivity to sugar that when they ingest it, they end up um, wanting and craving more. And then all the bad things happen, the weight gain and the whatever. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It's a, I'm on my soapbox, so you can get me off anytime you want. Oh, no, <laughs> no you're fine. I'm, like, as you were talking about that, I was just thinking, like, we're in that, that pinnacle of time of the holidays where, you know, yeah. no one will start a diet or will do anything because they're like, well, it's the holidays. I'm just going to eat everything that I want to eat. And <laughs> I mean, I do, I do believe in moderation when it comes to certain things, but like you are saying, like for me, gluten is not something that is in moderation for me. It's yeah. a no, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. like things, things like that, especially if you know that you have this addiction to it or you have this issue with it. I don't know. Um, I know for me personally that I struggle with sugar because I will have extreme highs and extreme lows with them. Mm. And I know that it can affect people in different ways, but it's crazy. I was even just talking to my husband the other day, like the difference in what I used to eat versus now, like in college, you know, like soda and candy and all the things to keep me awake at night so that I could mm. get my my stuff done, but it actually just made me feel worse. Like, it's just crazy. So how, I think, how can people maybe understand that this is something that's just as serious of an addiction as some of these other addictions can be? That's a real hard one. It's one of the ones that I struggled in my yeah. um, getting the information out because I mean, honestly, sometimes people can go 20, 30 years before there's a real like a diagnosis or something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Usually people, it's the weight gain, you know, people yeah. want to, they come in, we call it come in for the vanity, stay for the sanity kind of thing because mm -hmm. the brain fog clears up, you know, but our traditional uh, client, if you will, is a woman. Usually, I don't know why women are smarter probably, I think, <laughs> but they, they literally they're between 35 and 70 and they've mm -hmm. gained one to two pounds, some more, some a lot more, but on average, one to two pounds since high school or college. Mm. And when you do that math, people get upset with themselves when they're 20 or 30 pounds overweight. They're not like obese or anything, but they just feel bad. They don't, you know, and they can't seem to put, they've tried to put it down. I mean, every diet you ever read says no flour, no sugar, no white stuff, right? They quit yeah. the white stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so if I told you to quit broccoli or steak, you know, they, okay, no problem. You know, a month, yeah, two months, okay. Oh, I like steak, oh, three months, okay. But sugar, forget about it. You know, people are like, they seem to have to have it or whatever. And that belies the discussion we had about the brain chemicals, right? They're getting a little self-esteem boost. They're getting a little boost in their, in their mood. And that's what's stopping them. And that it's been, it's so, I mean, think about it. You may possibly be conditioned from the womb and, you know, everybody's by for their first birthday have had that people think it's cool to stick sugar in a mouth of a child baby a child doesn't even have any idea what it is i mean listen to this this is crazy you can look this up there's a product in the market called sweeties mm. and sweeties is like you know what a binky you know like a 
teething thing. Yeah. So yeah. you pull the pull the thing off and it's just a little cup, like a little yogurt cup or whatever, a little applesauce cup. And you put the teething ring in the in the product and then you put it in the baby's mouth to relieve pain for circumcision. Oh my goodness. Circumcision of a baby. You know what the product is made of? Sugar. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's straight sugar. So they realize instead of giving them a narcotic that this will ease the pain, right? Mm. And you can do this if a baby's crying, you can put the sweeties in its mouth and they'll stop completely. Just you leave them naked, cold, and get them to cry, and then put the sweeties in the mouth, the baby stops. Mm -hmm. Because they're getting a substance that makes them feel okay, that makes them feel good, right? And so here we are, 20, 30, 50 years later. And we're still using this ubiquitous, almost free product to manage these emotions. And that's the connection that people have to make. When they do make it, it's game on and game over. They can get out. Yeah. 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 That's such a, like a strong connection to have to make too. And to, yeah. to understand like as far back as it, as it could have come into. Like, I think, um, I've started to know that notice that even just in the last few years, not necessarily only sugar, but just food in general, how food was used while mm. I was growing up and how that affects me now and why it's, you know, more difficult for me to cut out certain foods versus other foods. Um, it's all emotional and mental and it all goes back <laughs> to when you were super young and it's crazy, yeah. but it's yeah. understandable why it's so difficult for people to stop. Right. Yeah, no, it's going to be a tectonic shift. It's going to be, you know, driving, drinking and driving, condoms in bathrooms, smoking in public places, these kinds of things that seat belts, whatever, things that, you know, science said enough. Science is, is winning this war. In the last five years, the advances in the understanding of the brain chemical stuff is just accelerated to no end. And before it was anecdotal, it was weight, it was health and stuff. And now it's more, uh, for me anyway, from an addictive background. And the, I'm interested in why people can't quit. I'm interested in why, how I can get them over the hump. Interested in building tribes of people who moderation just didn't work for them. They tried it. And some for decades. I mean, decades they tried with frustration to eat a little here, eat a little there. And the only result was more weight and more disease. And so I'm trying to make it cool, if you will. Be this be the cool kids club that people are abstinent sugar. And it's and look, I call it the gift of 90 days. Look, it's only just muscle it if you have to. Just mm -hmm. don't work on your emotions yet. Just muscle 90 days, no, no sugar, no flour, maybe no caffeine if you can do it. I have had zero recidivism. No one who actually stuck to the protocol, made it 90 days, who would want to risk going back. Mm. Because the weight loss, the, 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 the feelings of well-being return at day 60 or you know, in that area, that you start to, you don't realize you can feel this good. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that your body actually has chemicals that make you feel so much better than the substances were doing. And so now we're in a situation where um, nobody wants to go back after they make 90 straight days. So, And, and then it, it does start to be an emotional game. In this, I think PAUSE, which is post-acute withdrawal symptom in the, in the drug and alcohol world, exists in the sugar world too. In days 60 or 90 through 365, to stop that recidivism, you have got to understand that your mind is going to bust its hump to get mm -hmm. sugar back in because it feels good. Mm -hmm. It feels good to get a shot of dopamine and you don't have to run a mile to do it. You don't have to do exercise. You don't have to whatever, you know, go get a hug or anything that would produce a, a little bit of a dopamine shot for you. You don't have to do, you just got to ingest, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe to stop some irritable emotions that are either coming up or new and and so you, it becomes a mind game or a, an emotional mind game between days 30 or 60 or 90 and 365. Once you get to 365, you're pretty, it's calmed down a lot. You know? Yeah. You're still, you still got to think about it, but. Yeah. You've come up with some ways to. Yeah. To, some 
self-care methods that are that do take exercise you know like exercise like I, the idea of exercise for weight loss and calorie burning is such bunk what the exercise is really doing for the people that are succeeding is it's literally rewiring the brain chemicals mm. so that they can when they think about being upset for the day they go out for a run or a walk mm -hmm. or they you know walk the dog or they you know call a friend or you know hug a hug a loved one or whatever something that makes them feel gets a little shot of dopamine that's not a substance mm -hmm. right and it's that rewiring that re-engineering of our self-care our re uh you know our, our our emotional life our emotional feelings that helps that is the way that people succeed yeah yeah so how do you work with people? You kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but you work with people in person, online. What? How do you? How do you work with people? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, and I have tried. <laughs> I have been experimenting with a lot of different things. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, I think we need to build a tribe of people where this is cool. Mm -hmm. But the first, whatever, thirty, sixty, ninety, even six months or a year, people need someone who's traveled the path before yeah. who doesn't think you're crazy uh because really right people like your family your workmates yeah. uh whatever they're like put the record books away you are lost 30 pounds you look great you can have this at your birthday whatever. yeah <laughs> and that's usually the death nail you know, yeah that's the reason that's the people they end up um going back Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, you need to go into the bathroom, dial up somebody who knows you, who's been through with you this process and say, look, you know, I hate this line, but I think it's relevant. You know, nothing feels as good as thin looks or whatever, you know, this kind of uh, whatever their motivation is. Some mm -hmm. people, most people at the beginning is weight loss, but um, whatever their motivation is, you know, um, so you need that group of people on your team, on your side, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, a group, whatever. You just need a different tribe. If you want to you know, become a great tennis player, you're not gonna go hang out at the basketball court. You're gonna go hang out with tennis players and, and you'll wanna get good at tennis or you wanna be a participant or whatever. So that's what happens and that was, that's what needs to happen. And I'm trying to build the facility or the um, the online platforms and the coaching uh, things for that to happen for people. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think that that's so important. And I, I agree. That's a big reason that I started this podcast for people with chronic illness was specifically mm -hmm. to have that community feel where they yeah. felt like they could go and talk to like-minded people. So I know that it can be so, so helpful um, for sure. What do you, do you want to chat a little bit about your book? Yeah, the book is on Amazon. It's free. You can just mm -hmm. download it if you're in the United States. I think it's 99 cents. We're trying to get it in the other English speaking countries and something happened with Amazon, but I think it's 99 cents there, but yeah, it just really tells my story and it tells, mm -hmm. it's got a food plan. You know, the funny thing is people always come to me and they just want a food, a recipe book, the food plan and an, an instruction booklet. Mm -hmm. And the entirety of our conversation is overlooked about the emotions and the, you know, the social part of it. This is something that they don't think has to be part of the, the solution, right? They think it just give me the food, yep. give me the, how do you do it? What exercise do I do? You know, how many burpees or push-ups or whatever I do? <laughs> and that's just not how it works. And so the book explains all that and it tells about it, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we, you know, it's, it's doing, it does well on Amazon. It, it doesn't in a lot of ways sometimes because people are not ready to hear it. You know? mm. And it is free and people like, they get what they pay for. It. No, I'm just kidding. They, you know, they're not, they're, you know, they can neglect this solution, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're like the last house on the block mm -hmm. because people try um, all the diets, they try all the other methods and those don't seem to work for them. And then maybe if they've read this thing six months, six years, whatever later they call us and, and we go to work with them. Yeah. They're, they're afraid to let go of the sugar. So it's the last thing that they try. I, that's the main question. Do I have to do this for the rest <laughs> of my life? I said, no, no, just today. Just, just get, 
a day and then we'll see tomorrow. And then, you know, that one day of the time thing I kind of like, I really do like that. And so you know, they can put string together 91 days at a time. All of a sudden now they're excited. Yeah. You know, they're, they're on the other side and they're not wanting to have the same maladies that they had before. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the book's, uh, the website, sugaraddiction.com, I always say, <laughs> if you made your way to sugaraddiction.com, you don't have to worry about taking the quiz. You probably, you're up. You probably already, you know, have a problem with sugar. So. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Is there, yeah. um, if people wanted to reach out to you, is your website the best place for them to go? Yeah, they can go to sugaraddiction.com. We got a great, uh, summit that we do every year called the quit sugar summit. Mm. And, uh, it's, uh, and we have a, you can buy like 70 or 80 of the last four years there if you want. It's great for people who really want the science because we have every science, ed well, pretty much every science educator that ever talked about sugar, MDs, PhDs, Cornell, Harvard, we got them all. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can find it at quitsugarsummit.com. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's where the science part comes in. Mm -hmm. My science or my addictive stuff is a little softer, uh, a softer science, if you will, mm -hmm. more about community, more about helping folks um, uh, feel not alone, you know, feel not yeah. like they're like they're doing this in a, in a vacuum because their family thinks they're a little nuts. They maybe have a credibility problem because they've tried 30 diets before this mm -hmm. and now they're going to say no sugar and Maybe they're the meal, the meal preparer in the home, mm -hmm. and now they've got to cook two different meals and blah blah. You know, so it's a. I don't want to ever say it's easy because it isn't yeah. sometimes. And 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 when I do that, I say it's easy, and people, whatever, they buy something, or buy a program, and then they're they're upset. You know, I would prefer to tell them the real story that mm -hmm. this is going to take a little bit of effort, but if you do it, the rewards are insane. You know, I mean, I think that people like it, it truly becomes a personal development issue. You know, mm -hmm. like what goals are you not achieving because maybe your weight, maybe your self esteem because mm -hmm. of your weight or whatever, or your disease or so. You have to have a future that's more important or better looking than the one you're leaving. You have to have a reason why you want to do this. Yeah. And that goes back to that thing, the question you asked about, um, you know, how do you get people to understand it, right? And because they could go another 10 years and nothing would happen, probably. I mean, they're not going to die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if they really want to achieve, I always find the folks that we work with or the find that make our, their way to us as kind of pioneers, mm. pioneers in their family, pioneers in their work, pioneers in school, athletics, whatever. They weren't afraid to, uh, shall we say, uh, go against the grain of society. They were, you know, when all their friends were partying, they were going to track practice, whatever, you know, whatever it is, they made it happen. And those are the kind of folks I call them canaries in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. These are the folks that we like to work with and they're the people that are going to help us get this boulder up the hill so we can roll it downhill in the next 10 years. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So you're hoping that it'll just continue to grow. And like you said, you'll build, build a community of like-minded people. It's really yeah. important. It is. I mean, it, I think it's the whole key and I know it sounds simple or simplistic or whatever, but when people aren't alone and they can see the health results and feel the health results, because we've been talking this whole podcast about the feelings around this. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that you can feel so much better and not have a fluctuation up and down, up and down all the time and headaches and whatever. I mean, I haven't had a headache in 30 years. Like, wow. This is right. I mean, people think, is this possible? And I used to have headaches all the time. I mean, but it really wasn't a headache. It was my dose, my dosing was off. Mm. And when I put it to people that way, they're like, what do you mean my dosing was off? You're, it's like, you don't have enough sugar yeah. that day. And you, you're a little low. And when you get it up, your headache will go away. And that happens to people when they realize it. And the sweats, the night sweats, an interesting withdrawal phenomena. Oh. Same kind of dosing problem, right? Mm -hmm. 
people that are using sugar and then happen to have a couple of days where they're light on sugar start their withdrawals and they sweat at night, right? Mm. And they think it's some disease or the beginning of menopause or something <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah. And they run off and get a pill from a doctor or whatever. But in reality, when they go through the sugar withdrawals and they sweat at night solid for two or three nights, and then it never happens again because they don't ever even ingest sugar and it goes away 100% and never ever happens again, no matter how hot or cold the room is, then they're saying, oh, I see, I get mm -hmm. it, you know. And you can only see that from the other side. You yeah. can't see it from this side, you know, from, from the side where there's sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. Like it's interesting <laughs> that a lot of people and I understand why, like jump in it for like aesthetics or for weight gain or for because they've been diagnosed with something and they have to, yeah. but to then find out all of these ways that it had been affecting you right. um in other ways that you didn't even realize was happening. Like you said, with the night sweats and with like just the headaches. Headaches are huge for me. I still get headaches. Um, and yeah, when you get to a point where you've had them all your life and all of a sudden they stop, you're like, Whoa, <laughs> what just happened? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and you know, the, the withdrawal period, there's the headaches are massive. I mean, mm -hmm. really like people have never, that have never had migraines or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're like, and then the crazy part is people will literally ingest sugar and the headache will go away and then they won't come back for a while because they yeah. can't like there's, they feel like there's something wrong with them, but and there is, they're, they're eating too much sugar, yeah. but they're, they're not like putting two and two together here that once you get to the other side, the body was not meant to be in pain. The brain was definitely not meant to be in pain. Mm -hmm. And that if it gives the brain that kind of pain and the coming out process, then gosh, it's got to, they got to at least, you know, add two and two together here and make it, I don't know. It's, it's a little frustrating. I'm going to be honest. You know, it's a little frustrating because of the societal mm. acceptance of sugar now and culturation of 300 years of parties and Easter, and Christmas and Halloween and everything. Uh, now, 30 years after the high fructose corn syrup thing, 80% mm -hmm. of food products in a box or a bag or a can has sugar in it. So going 100% no sugar, is a, it is a challenge uh, for people. And, and they don't really, not that they don't get some benefit by reduction, but the real benefit comes when you test that beautiful, like if you're training for the Olympics or you're training a horse for the Kentucky Derby, you're not going to feed them junk. Yeah. And, and wh why wouldn't you do that even in a normal life that's not going to the Olympics? You know? Yeah. Uh, that's my thought. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally, I totally agree. And it's, it's, it's difficult to start for sure, but when it can provide so many, so much enlightenment on the other side, like yeah, you wish that you could, you could show that to everyone and make them understand it, but you kind of have to go through the process yourself to truly believe that it'll happen to you too. It's a hundred percent right. That's exactly right. And, and getting there is not easy. So it's, uh, it's like training for the Olympics. I mean, yeah. you've got to do your version of, having a couple of crappy weeks there um, mm -hmm. that seem impossible. This one symptom that is real prevalent these that I hear a lot about is this impending doom, this feeling of mm -hmm. impending doom. Like nothing has changed in your life. It's the mm -hmm. same as before, but you're feeling like uh, nothing's going right. And it's really just your brilliant, beautiful body's attempt to re-ingest. Uh. Dopamine is better than anything and serotonin and oxytocin yeah. is better than anything. You know, I mean, it's really a great feeling. Um, I mean, that's what it was developed to promote sexual behavior is promoted to be food searching, um, all of the good things in life that kept the species alive. Mm. So a million years of evolution, look at a million years of evolution, right? Yeah. And so, we're in the last, whatever, 300 years. That's like three minutes, <laughs> not even three minutes. It's like of a million years, you know, yeah. or whatever. So here we are trying to adulterate this beautiful specimen of a body and a brain. Uh, and we're trying to, even the doctors with the, 
the SSRIs and the, the I mean, there's a great woman out there, Kelly Brogan. She used to be mm -hmm. a, you know, who she is. Yeah. Yeah. She's good, right? And, uh, you know, they're trying to dial it in. They're trying to dial in how you feel. Well, people are every day trying to dial in how they feel with their coffee and their sugar and their sugar. They're like, oh, I don't feel so good. Well, I'm going into a real important meeting. Three cups today, two cups tomorrow. Bye. You know, they're like trying to do it like, uh, how shall I say, without the without prescription drugs. They're trying to do it over the counter, sugar, flour, caffeine, whatever. And it never works because <laughs> you can't get the ratios right. Never. Yeah. You can't get them right. But what you can get right is 100% abstinent from them and then optimize exercise and brain chemicals. And then you just keep going up and up and up because you can control it. You understand it. It doesn't vary in the day. Mm -hmm. So, And it doesn't vary because of a substance even. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy to me. All of these things are <laughs> so interesting, but it makes so much sense. Like, yeah. even just with you know, like you're talking about with, um, like caffeine or with sugar, like, you know, you think like, okay, if I drink those two cups before I go into this meeting, I'm going to feel so much better, but then you get addicted to two cups. And then the next meeting, you, <laughs> you gotta get cups. three. <laughs> like that, that has happened to me with caffeine for sure. And usually when I hit like where I feel like I need more than one cup a day, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> this is interesting. Law of diminishing returns. There. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All jittery and yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that, uh, uh, I don't know how, what you call it, that management of emotion by sugar, flour, and caffeine is uh, interesting. Because most people don't binge, most, a lot of people binge at night on mm -hmm. sugar, because sugar kind of brings you down like a depressant, right? And yeah. makes you feel better. I mean, and but the caffeine, that's like, we're going up and during the day. And then nobody has, like, to trying to manage their sleep, Nobody tries not to drink coffee after three or four o'clock, you know, because you know, won't be going to get any sleep. Yeah. And it's like the body wasn't meant to not get sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a very real phenomenon if you drink too much of this stuff. Right. So, yeah, it's a, it's, <laughs> I think there's a great, I can't remember his name. He's like a uh, guru, an Indian guru. There's nothing healthy to be a, well adapted to a sick society or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it's uh, it's so true, and that's why you need that group of people who, and they're small now. I'm going to be honest; they're not giant groups any yet of people. I mean, the twelve step stuff for the alcohol and drugs, whatever people think of that, is just a nice community. They don't have to worry about the God or the whatever their other rules are, but that's where people go, and you know they don't think they're crazy to not have a beer for, with every whatever. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh and now we're trying to grow that around sugar and, and what you're doing is awesome too, because people feel isolated, you know, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Is there anything else that we missed or that you want to tell the listeners of the podcast today? The only thing I think we did cover it tangentially a little bit on during the thing is that, if you're the type, and this is where I'm me looking for the canaries in the coal mine, mm -hmm. I'm looking for the folks who are, um, they think for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. They're willing to go out, do the research. They're not afraid to do something different than their fellows. Uh, they're willing to um, go meet some new people. I'm, I'm a, you wouldn't tell it sometimes when I'm talking one on one, but I'm pretty much of an introvert. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not a big joiner and going to meetings and all that kind of stuff. But you do have to, join a new tribe to to change this type of behavior. It does need an inordinate amount of support mm -hmm. because society is so um, ingrained in it. And I don't think in a bad way, good way, let's just leave it a neutral way, okay? Mm -hmm. It is. It really, they are ingrained in the use of sugar products in their life. Probably not going to change right away and they're definitely not going to change for you. So you've got to be a little bit of a pioneer and a little bit willing to go against the grain and do your own research and find out a way for you to at least test it. All I ask is just test it. Just go 90 straight days without it and see how you feel. We'll gladly refund any misery, any headaches, any weight gain if, you, if it doesn't work, right? Yeah. And look, like I said, if I said no steak, 90 days, oh, you know, but 
just do this and see what happens. So that's yeah. it. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for all this info. I'm so excited for everyone to hear it.